Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. Oh, Ryan, that high was just eardrum bursting. Well, I'm feeling it today because we are going to uh, space. We're, we're going to the moon. We're going back to space. I think this actually uh, functions as a great sequel to our space tourism episode. Totally. Okay. We're going to link to that in the show notes because folks should really check that one out if they oh, haven't heard it. You, lo- you love making me dig up links. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to put it in the show notes. That's a great episode. One of our most popular episodes. But today we are going to play my interview with Sandra Tetley who is the Historic Preservation Officer at Johnson Space Center down in Houston. It's like your dream job. Well, it's every History Nuts dream because what Sandra Tetley and her team have been working on for the past six years, they have been restoring and getting ready for visitors that famous room, Mission Control Center, where uh, those on the ground monitored and uh, supported the astronauts that actually landed on the moon on uh, July 20th, 1969. And of course, this is in celebration of its 50th anniversary. And this is the same uh, mission control that Tom Hanks said, Houston, we have a problem to. We've got some housekeeping to do beforehand. The first is, I understand that you heard from a listener, uh, somebody who had had tuned in during our uh, Pacific Northwest episode. And uh, what did you receive? Yeah, so... Um, a listener, Michael, uh, reached out to us over the old uh, OOO podcast Instagram. Uh, oh, sent, slip, wait, wait, slipped into the DMs? Is slid, that? Slid in. Oh, slid into the yeah. DMs. Yeah, I guess slipped, slid in. is, slipped isn't as sexy. No. Oh, 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 I'm oh. sorry. I slipped into your DMs again. <laughs> Oof. Um, so he slid into the DMs and, and he said, uh, hey, uh, just listening to the old uh, episode. And Ryan said, uh, you know, because Ryan is very hip and in the know. He didn't say this, but I could tell uh, you. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> let, that there let, should be a band called uh, the Subduction Zone. Yep. Subduction now, remember, you zone. were talking about the sub- Subduction Zone uh, in relation to, uh, was it a volcano? Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I was talking about in relation to the volcanic activity and the eventual earthquake that's going to hit the Pacific Northwest. Right, and I said, and you uh, that it was uh, it would make a great name name for a band, and you said that's a terrible joke. I'm yeah, gonna I, cut it. and I said I was going to cut it, and then I I thought it was funny to keep in uh, you making a bad uh, Dave Barry joke, so I kept right. it in. Well, it it inspired uh, Michael to reach out to us. Uh, and 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 send along a uh, album cover of uh, the Subduction Zone band. <laughs> it's not Subduction. The sub, what is it? <laughs> Actually, I like subdun- Subduction Zone. I, I like Subduction a lot better. That's a lot more fun to say. Yeah. Well, he reached out and he sent he sent us uh, an image, and there is a band uh, called uh, the Subduction Zone. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've got some great, some great hits. I guess uh, they put on an album in 2011 that he said is "quote unquote" not listenable. Oh, um, wow! He didn't think it was strong, but they've got some great tunes. It looks like called "Gather Round," "In the Streets," "Middle of the Valley," and "Blue Skies." So uh, we're going to have to obviously link to this on the old Insta. Do you think it, we it, might be able to just play a quick clip? Uh, you know what? I think we should. Let's hear a little bit <laughs> of "Subduction Zones." Zones. Ooh! Well, oh! Yeah! Oh! Yeah, I! Yeah. That is not what I was expecting. Well, look, they should thank us because this is the most airtime they've gotten since they released this album in 2011. Yeah. It actually makes me wish that tsunami were coming a little quicker. Yeah, save us from this. Well, I don't know that they had they put out a lot more albums, but uh, the cover art uh, is is them standing over an exploding volcano, and the four band members it lo- either being uh, it looks like being just kind of thrown out of the volcano from the force of the uh, of the blast. So. Really, really good stuff. I want to thank Michael for finding that and sending it in and, uh, you know, admitting that I know a lot about, uh, you know, independent uh, rock and roll. Right. And this is actually an important point uh, based on that Pacific Northwest uh, episode that we've got back there. Uh, I th- I've got a, a news story, an update that I think counts as a recalculating. Recalculating? Recalculating. Now, Ryan, you know uh, re- what recalculating is. 
It's when you've made a mistake <laughs> no, and we no. correct it here on the on the podcast. No, no, no. Uh, recalculating. It is sometimes for that purpose. Sometimes we hear from a listener, oh, you mispronounced that or you misconstrued that. Um, but it's also uh, for follow ups. Uh, so, you know, we've covered a story. We, You and I have dove deep on a topic. And then people say, you missed this important point that you should right. uh, really talk about. And in the Pacific Northwest episode, uh, where Subduction Zone came up was I was talking about how um, there was a New Yorker article called The Big One. And it was all about, it was by Catherine Schultz, and it was about um, how there's a, a huge uh, fault line off the coast of Washington and Oregon that right. not many people think about, but that someday it, there is going to be an earthquake that causes a quite massive tsunami to hit uh, that coastline, and it's in great danger. Well, as it turns out, there was a recent follow-up to that article on NewYorker.com, and uh, I will put it in the show notes, but the gist of it is the, uh, the, the state government of Oregon is not heeding her warning, and they have recently uh, voted to allow a new construction in what they know are tsunami zones. So there will now be uh, everything, including public buildings, hospitals, schools, uh, being built uh, in these uh, dangerous areas. You know, that seems that seems like a really good idea, except that's probably like really primo land that's going to upset people, right? Well, Ryan, that's actually uh, exactly the reason that they're turning over this 1995 prohibition on, on new public facilities in this, what is called the tsunami inundation zone. And um, it's... It, oh God, when you call when you call a neighborhood that, it's not going to be very popular. So n- not only will they be uh, spurring the building of schools, hospitals, prisons, uh, firehouses, and police stations, I'm pulling these directly from the article, but um, they, uh, the, they're they kind of justifying it to themselves by saying there's going to be this economic boon where all of these uh, restaurants and hotels and things that are along the shoreline are going to want to build there. But, you know, it, it is, again, this question of do we really want to be encouraging tourism in these dangerous areas. Now, I say this as somebody who, as I took this road trip through the Pacific Northwest, drove in and out of these tsunami areas, and they're very well marked uh, throughout the whole uh, trip along the Oregon coast. But do we have evidence that people are going to these areas in, in the hopes that there would be a, uh, you know, they would see a tsunami, tsunami trackers or whatever? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think the, it's not a suggestion that people are going to be sort of thrill-seeking, go out there for the tsunami. But it's just to say that uh, that w- when the big one comes, and, and it will come, uh, that uh, it, it's going to be even more dangerous because we will have built even more things, like things you need during a tsunami, like, I don't know, police, firemen, and hospitals. Yeah, it, it, uh, you know, it sounds a little bit like the uh, like Chernobyl zone, right, where they, just, where they just emptied all those things out, and there was just like empty, there was empty hospitals, empty, empty schools. It's sort of like, is that gonna, is it, are they going to... Have they already been built and they're going to be emptied or not? It's just not built at all. They're just not going to build there. Yes, there are communities that are already within these zones. Um, So what happens to those communities? Well, those communities will be devastated when this happens. But I also remember, Ryan, in that episode, you had asked me how likely is it uh, to have this earthquake? Like, are we due for one? And in this follow-up, I thought there was a good statistic to to teach us uh, why this might not be a great idea. Uh, Catherine Schultz says, Um, in the next 50 years, so, you know, in our lifetime, in the next, God willing, in, in the next 50 years, Oregon faces a one in three chance of experiencing a tsunami comparable to those that recently devastated Japan and Indonesia. One in three chance in the next 50 years. I don't like those odds. That's a, I mean, those would be really good odds if you were playing poker or something, but no, not, not this, this is, this is, these are bad odds. And I'm sure that if you look at this, uh, this is only one fault line. Uh, I'm sure if you look at, uh, the freak, uh, weather that's happening, you know, we, we're having hundred year floods and thousand year floods. I mean, it is, it is getting really wild out there. Yeah, absolutely. So Ryan, people should, uh, I think they should do what I did. They should, uh, drive through these areas, enjoy these areas, uh, but then, uh, drive to higher ground to stay the night. You know, you know where else it's a not very hospitable place to live. Where's that, Ryan? The moon. That's, true. That's a great point. Absolutely, Ryan. So with no more dillion or dallion, why don't we get to my interview with Sandra Tetley, the historic preservation officer at Johnson Space Center in Houston, to talk about restoring mission control. And now it's time to really take off. <laughs> You're really going to want to buckle in for this one. 
flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. Today I'm joined by Sandra Tetley, the Historic Preservation Officer and Real Property Officer at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And I'm super excited to have Sandra, particularly now, because uh, this Saturday, the world celebrates the, the launch, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, the mission that delivered man to the moon. And uh, Tetley herself is a key part of that story and is here to talk about her work preserving, protecting, and newly opening to the public Mission Control Center in Houston, which is where the ground crew that supported Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, among many other astronauts and missions, did their job. So, Sandra, thank you so much for joining. Oh, great. Thank you for having me. So uh, wh why don't you begin by telling us, when, when I say mission control, what exactly does that encompass? When we're talking about newly opening mission control to the, to the public, uh, what are we talking about? Okay, so uh, what we're talking about is what we call it Apollo Mission Control, and it is, it's, it's one of the mission control uh, centers in Building 30, which is at Dalton Space Center. And what, what the mission control uh, constitutes is the, uh, the visitor's viewing room, and then the um, mission operations control room, which we call the MOKER, and the summary display room, which is uh, the, or the back cave is what we call it. It is, it's behind um, the, it's the projection room that is behind the large screens that you'll see. Mm. And then the um, simulation control room, which is where the simulators actually uh, were sitting when they would do simulations for each mission. So those those rooms constitute the mission control center. And uh, when we're talking about, you know, I mentioned Apollo 11, but the, the particular control room we're talking about covered many, many more missions than just that, right? It, yes, it did. It started with the Gemini missions and then went all the way through the Apollo program and then the, the Apollo Soyuz and then the shuttle program. So it was used up to about 1992. And when did it open? The building actually opened in like, 1965. And the first mission flown out of there was the gym, one of the Gemini missions. And so uh, mission control, you know, I think uh, in, the, in the minds of many listeners, we'll be thinking back to kind of two uh, pieces of pop culture. The first, I would say, is probably that recent documentary, Apollo 11, which uh, Ryan and I have talked about on the podcast before. And uh, the second, I think, is Apollo 13, right? Houston, we have a problem. This is right. who they were, were reporting to. That's and right. it's that room with those long banks of consoles uh, with uh, typically men sitting there, many in horn rimmed glasses and thin ties, uh, right. smo smoking cigarettes and drinking cola, right? Lots of cigarettes, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, but you said it was actually, this center was actually used all the way into the 90s. Yes, yes it was. Um, as technology changed, the, the modules in each console were removed and the new technology was put in. So when we finally started working on the mission control, um, they, it was a hybrid of Apollo modules and shuttle modules. Mm. So it was used all the way up to the shuttle program um, up to 1992 when they built um, the addition 30 South. And that is where the, the white flight control room was that ended up uh, finishing the shuttle program. And what happened after they stopped running shuttles from it? So um, as part of the Texas Historic Preservation Officer, um, he is part of the mitigation to closing mission control down. He just made them uh, leave the consoles in that room and then took out a lot of the equipment that they were going to excess and we stored it in a warehouse. So that room just became open as a, as a uh, visitor area. And then also, if you could get into Building 30, like you had controlled access, you could also get onto the floor of, of the the moker and actually go and sit on the consoles and touch the buttons and, and dial the phones. And so it was, it was just unabated access. Wow. And so that must have resulted in a lot of wear and tear, let alone the 30 years of actually functioning in, from the Gemini missions through to the nineties. It did. Yeah. It was pretty uh, well worn when, when uh, it was closed as a mission control. And, but then over the years, just, uh, it was not maintained. It was not, you know, people ate at the consoles and they would have orientations for co-ops and they'd have movie night and things like that. And so there was, it just continued to be used and it was not kept or, or preserved or cleaned or anything. They had movie nights? 
They did. They had movie nights. They used to show Apollo 13 on the big screen. Well, that so, would be yeah. pretty cool. I, ho- I yeah. hope we continue that program <laughs> soon. No, we're not continuing that. It's, <laughs> it's strictly going to be a museum now. And so where do you enter this story? In 2013, I applied for a grant with the National Park Service uh, Heritage Partnership Program. And I applied for a $5,000 grant to do some sort of um, experience for visitors that they could sort of experience the moon landing in some respect. And so the assistant regional director actually called me and was very interested. So he and uh, the Heritage Partnership Program manager came down and saw Mission Control and um, thought, you know, how it was and what it looked like. And so they offered me $20,000 for a grant, and then they matched it to do a historic furnishing survey. And what that is, is that's a very detailed analysis um, from no, leave no stone unturned on what it would take to bring the Mission Control Center back to its um, historic state or back to its original condition. And so that's kind of how this all got started. Wow. I mean, you must have been shocked to get the call that said, oh, guess what? We actually want to give you much more money than you requested. (laughs) I did. Yeah, I was actually really surprised when they called and said, hey, we're very interested in your project. Can we come down and see it? And I said, sure. And, um, you know, they're used to managing and maintaining National Historic Landmarks, which is Building 30 is the National Historic Landmark. So Apollo Mission Control is sort of like the cherry on the cake. And they were pretty, um, you know, they, they saw that it really needed some some attention and that it could be restored back to its grandeur. And so they were, you know, they got it kicked off and um, we went from there. But yeah, it was, it was thrilling. Just, it was a big honor. And so what year uh, was that kind of kickoff? When did it become closed to the public and the, the restoration work begin? Oh, wow. It, we didn't even close it to the public until, um, let's see, it was about November of 2018. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the viewing room basically looks over the Moker. Is that yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so during missions, who would have been in that viewing room? So that would have been uh, NASA headquarters management, the families of the astronauts, uh, any other VIPs, um, you know, people from management at JSC and, um, you know, things like that. It was They were pretty strict when it came to a mission, uh, who could go in there. And... Um, it was it was not open to the public. In other words, it was open to people who had had some kind of business or or a dealing with uh, any of the flight controllers or astronauts. And so uh, the consoles themselves are, I, I understand, the technology is configured to the Apollo fifteen emission, uh, mission, right? Yeah, that's yeah, that's another complication. Uh, interesting. So the in working with the flight controllers, the preservationists, and the, the ship on Park Service, Apollo fifteen was the height of the technological advancement for the Apollo program. After Apollo 15, there weren't any more changes to consoles or modules or anything. So so it was important for the flight controllers that they wanted to acknowledge that that was the height of the technology at the time. And so we worked with them to, so the consoles themselves are the configuration of Apollo 15. Um, And one of the biggest differences is that the the ENCO console, which was the, the communications uh, person who, who did a lot of the communications and radio, that console didn't exist in Apollo 11, but in a, by Apollo 15, it had its own console. Mm. And so you'll see that console as part of our, um, you know, the console configuration. And so let's talk about recreating the room itself. What does it take to, you know, actually bring us back? I mean, I'm thinking everything from the ceiling tiles, the wall color, the carpets. I mean, did you even know what it looked like? Uh, there, the only way that we knew what it looked like was from um, the, the film, the, or the, the imagery, you know, uh, film that was shot in the, in the Moker, uh, photographs that were taken in the Moker, and then we went back to the original drawing. So mm. we, could, we could see the finishes of, of the, um, that were, you know, on the drawings, but we had a hard time determining exactly, you know, what that was and, and what was what was going to happen. So we, of course, we knew it needed new carpet and we were actually going to leave the wallpaper. But we had a few things that happened that were kind of interesting. Um, someone removed a fire extinguisher off the wall in the moker um, for some reason. And behind it, we found the original wallpaper. 
So wow. <laughs> using, yeah, it was very cool. So using the original plans, um, we determined that the manufacturer that they had gone to, and we went back to that company, which had been purchased by another company. We went back to that company and they actually in their warehouse found the roller. So they were able to recreate our wallpaper and uh, in the mocha. Then the other thing uh, when they were doing research is underneath the nomadic tube stations, which are the, we call them P-tubes, but those are those tubes like you see at the banks, you know, that go back and forth. Um, under those, when it was re-carpeted, they had not picked up the P-tubes because they're attached to big, large tubes and they're difficult to get up. They had just carpeted around those. So we found the original carpet in those P-tube stations and they were able to go back to Mohawk carpet and um, using the carpet we found was woven, which they don't do anymore. And they um, did, did use their same tufted method, but they added an additional yarn and were able to recreate our carpet. So that was another thing that was just, you know, fantastic because because we got, you know, near nearly uh, the original carpet that was in the mocha. And then another cool thing was the ceiling tiles. We actually found an original ceiling tile in one of the phone booths in the lobby of, of Building 30, which we're, we're keeping those two. It's hard to find phone booths. But anyway, but we found that. And we're using an Armstrong tile uh, as a base that we actually hand stamped the whole pattern in, those, in each one of those ceiling tiles. And they used a computer um, graph of the tiles and they used a series of small pins and nails to create a stamp and they literally hand stamped every tile wow so, i mean it's a ama- it's an amazing thing I, you know there's such good fortune in the fact that somebody was too lazy to like newly wallpaper behind <laughs> behind the, the fire exactly, extinguisher yes <laughs> I, I mean the idea that you were able to find the roller yes is, Wasn't that cool? <laughs> it's it's amazing. I mean, it's just amazing what first that 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 it still exists. Secondly, that somebody actually knew where it was. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, unbelievable. And I think that they um, somebody has said that they actually do use it. You know, it is a pattern that you can get. Hmm. But yeah, but we had we had no idea. Of, and that was that was wonderful to get to because the wallpaper and the carpet together. Now that you see it, it is such a complete package now that the colors that were originally designed with the, the kind of the meadow green consoles, it just brings out the whole 1960s architecture so well. So it just, I mean, it looks really good. I think, uh, I think that roller is going to be great for the gift shop. I know. I know. <laughs> Where does the video and audio come from? I mean, we're, I mean, I was very struck in, in the Apollo 11 documentary, just, how much was invested in capturing this moment? And, you know, we're all, we're right. all benefiting for that today. Oh, but right. How about what was actually on the individual screens and, and, and uh, uh, mission controllers speaking to one another? How was that recorded? So, uh, yeah, that was, what was on the screens was a, a huge deal because NASA did not, you know, we didn't keep anything like that. Plus, uh, they were basically being shown uh, data or, or pages that were on a, you know, on a screen that was generated at the time, they weren't captured in any, you know, fact, like there's no videotape of that. We could right. just, we could just see it every now and then I come across a, one, one of the images on a, on a film or a cameraman. Right. So what we had to do is we had to go back and using that small bit of data, we extrapolated, you know, what, what would have come, you know, during this EET, these EET periods. And then we worked with the flight controllers themselves to try to get get down and make sure that the, it was as accurate as we could make it. And everything that's on the summary display screens and on the console monitors it is all regenerated through animation. Um, you know, there's computer programs that they've developed to make it look like the old um, the computer and, and data readout on the monitors. And then everything, the, the large screens with the, the moon map and the, the limb and the command module flying across, all that had to be created by uh, animators. And everything had to be synced up with the GET time, what exactly was showing during those times. The clocks had to work because the clocks were gone, so the clocks were a projector made to look old. Mm. And, and all of that had to be synchronized then with the audio. And we, um, 
we worked with the two guys from Apollo 11, um, Ben Feist and Steven Slater, on ensuring that that audio and the, the film and the imagery was, was accurate so we could get it all you know, completely accurate. So what you see is a recreation of what the flight controllers themselves would have seen during those periods of the mission. And that audio has been cleaned up and, and logged by a hobbyist, right? Yes. He took all of all 30 tracks of um, the flight controllers. And, you know, they talked to one another, but they also talked a lot to their backroom support. So he has all of that. And so we were able to, you know, he, he has um, got it all lined up by GETs, so any of the, which is ground elapsed time. So any of the GETs, at a time, we could pull out any of those discussions or any of the comments made. So we were able to really create and bring back all of the anxiety that was happening when the alarms started going off during descent and what was happening at the time, um, you know, the, the conversations that were happening. And it's, it's much more than what you would just hear off of the internet or um, anywhere else. It is, it's very, we've really tried to capture the flight controller and what they did and the decisions that they made when they were trying to make these decisions to land and then once land to stay and, and when to walk and you know all the, the steps of the mission. So it was just, it was wonderful working with them because it, it's, it's come out so great. I mean, I, I, we've literally had people uh, tear up and cry uh, wow. during this district experience. And uh, how about all the little fun, little treasures? So, you know, my understanding is, you haven't taken an approach where you want it to be kind of an anodyne, not lived in, you know, newly opened mission control. You want this to look like the the engineers, the mathematicians, the mission controllers have just stepped out of the room. And so right. you have filled it with kind of the t detritus that would be there uh, if it were working and the mission were actually going on. So w tell us what we can expect to see there and how you found it all. Oh, yeah, that's Fun story too. Uh, so we we got went through just copious amounts of film and photographs and just talking to the flight controllers. And so we've been able to identify on each console during those parts of the mission. And, and basically, we, we just captured the Apollo Eleven mission and what that flight controller drank, what his coffee cup looked like, what his documents looked like, um, whether or not he smoked. What, what brand of cigarette he smoked or what ashtray was on his, his console, pen, paper, if he had a pencil sharpener, and all of those things we've been able to put back on the consoles. And um, it took, there's one lady, Delaney Hare Spence, and she, I think, I swear she's got the largest eBay account now ever. But <laughs> she, was on, she was on eBay and went to, you know, antique shops and thrift stores to find all those items. Um, every coffee cup, uh, every ashtray, we did have people donate um, some ashtrays to us, and, and a, some of the things actually came from site, like the three hole punches and, um, you know, things like that. But we got everything, and, and, and I try to tell people, you know, we just didn't go out and document this and find this stuff and throw it on a console. Everything is specifically placed. And, and it's funny, we had one flight controller that we've been working with for a long time. He has said, now, you know, that, com that coffee cup that's on top of my console, I would have never done that. I don't know whose coffee cup that is, but um, I think y'all need to move that. And so I told Delaney, and so we have four pictures of him looking over that orange cup on his console that he just didn't even realize, you know, was even there. So it's kind of funny to go back and say, well, you know, here's that orange coffee cup sitting right here. <laughs> but... Uh, but but she even found the, the rocket coffee pot new in a box that they had with, to make coffee out of. And so that, that's kind of the crowning jewel to me. I just love that coffee pot. And, uh, but yeah, we, we have tried to make it look like uh, they just got up and walked out. And uh, how much of the restoration work, you know, the, the furniture work, the painting and building of the consoles, how much was that? It, it, was it kind of a labor of love of Texas or did you do it all over the U.S. or all over the world? Uh, actually, most of the contractors that worked on this came from Texas. Uh, the, the consoles were restored and um, put back together and then had the LED lights and the, the uh, players that, that play the um, videos on the screens. They're from Kansas, from uh, Hutchinson, Kansas. 
but the lady that restored the viewing room seats, and they're all 100% original, except for the, we have new cushions in them. He's from uh, up the Dallas Plano area. And then uh, my, my prime contractor is from Denver. She's, they're out of Denver. But the historic preservation expert, Adam Graves, he is from the Fort Worth area. And then Sterling Beachick Architect, who did everything inside except for the console, uh, they're from Houston. So, um, and we had all kinds of specialists too. We had a we had a finishes expert from Galveston, and he could identify original paint and not original paint. He was able to un- uncover original column markers. Uh, we have the audio video visual guys who um, they're called audio video guys. They're up in Houston as well, and they're the ones that did all the, the projection systems in the back. Um, and then, then Ben and Ben Feist and Steven, they're from out of the country, and then the animator we use is, is a, was from Canada. But everybody else is within the state of Texas. And uh, what other projects do you work on at uh, a Johnson Space Center now that now that you've completed? Well, I guess you said there's still a little work to be done on this one, but a little bit. But. <laughs> <laughs> what what uh what what's still out there for for you to preserve and save? What's the next big project? Uh, well, I got you know the the federal government's under a mandate to reduce square feet, and so uh, demolition of buildings is a big deal right now. And I'm trying to save as many of the original buildings as we can. And try to try to get um, the agency to reutilize them because they were built in in a very modular fashion. Because it, the space program was changing so quickly that the interior of these interiors of these buildings were made uh, with metal walls that could be un- just they basically snapped together. And so I'm I'm trying to get uh, our our management and, and the agency to reutilize these buildings. But um, but there's a big, you know, there's different pots of money to do different things. And plus, everybody really wants new. So yeah. I, kind of, I kind of fight that. But um, but the next, my next big project, I guess you'd say, is uh, Building 37 was the Lunar Receiving Laboratory where they brought the first moon rocks back to Earth and where the astronauts were quarantined when they came back to Earth. Oh, yeah. And so that building is is going to be demolished and so we are developing an interpretive part for it so that you can come to the come to the space and you still kind of get a you can get a look and feel of what that building was about and how important it was because that was a very that's probably our second most historic building on site and then i then i have to take care of just the day-to-day regulatory um things around site because the uh, the astronauts were quarantined for what over a week right uh, 18 days. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because yeah. Uh, basically they had no idea what chemicals could be on them after they had been on the moon, whether they would be radiated. And so right. this was the safe space. I don't suppose any of that still exists, the, the space they were quarantined in besides the building. It, well, it does. It, it all it still exists right now. It's been changed a little bit, but you could still go in and see the astronaut, um, their, their little apartment. And each astronaut apartment connected to another little room that where the, uh, their own personal doctor was. And you can see the area where they had the, the um, you know, the very famous picture where they're behind the glass. Yes. And then and they're talking to the press. You know, that room still exists. But there's some very historic parts of the building. And, and that my favorite part I'm trying to say is the uh, county room, which is the, the largest it's almost like a missile silo. It goes down over 50 feet into the ground. And at the very bottom is lead lined and pre-atomic steel um, lined room where they would take the astronauts and determine their level of radiation. Huh. And so that was, um, that's a, a really cool, um, very unusual, you know, piece of architecture in the world. And so I'm, I'm really trying to save that uh, in some respect. And um, so that, but that room is really, and even the place where they brought the Apollo 11 capsule in, that, that's still there, that loading dock where they brought that in. So it's kind of cool. We're going to save it to make it, um, you know, kind of be where you can go in and kind of get a glimpse of, of how that was separated into the different, uh, you know, they had the, the whole moon rock section that was kind of um, kept and then the, 
the isolation for the astronauts themselves and then just the administrative part. So we're going to kind of keep that some way for people, for people and tourists to see. And is any part of that on the tour today? No, the building's actually closed. So it's just, yeah. It's just if you're lucky enough to come here and find somebody that will take yeah. you in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, so, I, I mean, it, it just it just begs for tourist Instagram photos. You know, get behind oh. that glass and pretend that you're being quarantined. It's perfect. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, and I guess uh, my my final question is, uh, can you just walk us through what can uh, visitors to Johnson Space Center experience today? So we, you know, you've given us a sense of what the the brand new kind of t- walking through the the launch, the moon landing, the return. What else uh, is available to tourists? Okay, so to get the tour of JSC, um, you have to go through Space Center Houston. And so when you when you pay your fee to go there, uh, there's different tram tours that will take you through site, and you can see the Saturn V rocket that we have. Uh, they also have an exhibit with a shuttle carrier aircraft and an orbiter on top of it. And But the, the tram tours will bring you actually on site and there's one special tour that will take you to Apollo Mission Control, and you can sit in the viewing room, and you can go through the visitor experience and take pictures. Uh, the other tours will take you to Building 9, which has the International Space Station mock-ups and, and trainers, and then the robotics area. And, um, and there's also the Shuttle Avionics and Integration Lab in Building 16, which is a, it's actually a shuttle orbiter without its skin. It's where they would, would test uh, flight hardware. I, oh, I'm sorry, flight software. And so you actually can go in there and you see this just big, huge orbiter, and it has no skin. So you see these just miles and miles of cabling and, and electrical wires and boxes and controllers, and it's it's really fascinating. And um, so you kind of get a taste of what goes on here. Uh, in the it's kind of in the past, but when you go to uh, building nine, you'll see kind of our future. You can see the Valkyrie robot and Robonaut and, and that kind of thing. So um, it it's cool. I mean, you can take you to the side and it's kind of, it's an interesting place. But mission control is definitely the jewel in the crown, it sounds like. It is. It is the jewel in <laughs> the crown. It really is. It probably will come as a surprise to most people that this hadn't been kept up and protected over the years. But I, I'm just so thankful that you and your contractors and everybody you brought together uh, stepped in to save this important part of American history. Uh, we often talk about the National Parks uh, Service uh, and, and praise them on, on this podcast. I'm a big National Parks nut. And, Absolutely. Uh, so I just want to say thank you so much for, for the work you've done. I can't wait to get to Houston uh, to visit it. And uh, I know most of my listeners will feel the same. Absolutely. I'd love to take you through it. Oh, you, you will definitely be my first email because I need okay. to get that quarantine picture. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Yes. Well, Sandra Tetley, thank you uh, so much for your time. And uh, now it's time for the last stop. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. Wow. I am, I am like, I have never wanted to go to Houston more. <laughs> have you ever wanted to go to the moon more? Well, I mean, I've always wanted to go to the moon. We've we've had whole episodes about that, but now I want to go to Houston to you know to to live this sort of uh, this history. Yeah, Ryan, I think uh, it's definitely one of those national treasures that I am just so thankful that uh, these enterprising individuals and the National Park Service came together to preserve for humanity. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's just another. It's just another great thing that Americans can go and feel and feel good about our history. You, you know, know it, it doesn't happen all that, that often. Well, you know what pisses me off, though, was I was just in Houston like two months ago before this opened, and and now I got to go back. Reason to go back. Reason to go back. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, I, I like throwing in those deep cuts for, for those listeners, those longtime listeners. They're going to know exactly who Catherine is. All right, Ryan. Well, we're here in the last stop. My favorite segment, your favorite segment, the people segment. It's a moment of, of pause for us to, to meditate, to calm down. Here at the end of the show, we're winding down, and it's the last segment where you and I each take a moment to share one thing that we've seen, done, read, tasted, smelt, uh, bought, that feeds the spirit of wanderlust within us even during the workaday week. So, Ren, this week, what is your last stop? This week, I want to call out some really bad travel writing. Oh, uh, whoa. Ha- 
have you heard about the Dominican Republic, the the deaths that oh, have been reported in yes, the Dominican I have, Republic? Absolutely. Yeah. And you've seen these headlines and you've seen this clickbait and and you know, it is they are reporting that American tourists are dying in the Dominican Republic at what appears to be an unnatural pace. Yes. Right? Yes. So 2.7 million Americans visit the Dominican Republic every year, right? Uh, 17 Americans in the past three years have died of natural causes or mm-hmm. what we, we think to be natural causes in the Dominican Republic. Mm-hmm. Um, that is not a huge number of people when you consider that 2.7 million people visit the Dominican Republic every year. Um, Slate has a fantastic article where they've looked at a handful of, full of studies mm. um, that uh, show what percentage of people uh, die while traveling, um, of natural causes while traveling. And it looks to be about 0.015% mm-hmm. um, based okay. on a handful of studies. A Scottish and a, a, fin, a, a Finnish study have both come up with this number pretty close to that. Uh, so it, that number in the context of that many millions. Right. Should come around, should come out to 400 American tourists dying every year in the Dominican Republic. So that's a Republic. one a day. Right. But we're in, dropping like flies. No, but we're not. We're not, right? Only 17 in the, in the last three years have died from natural causes in the Dominican Republic, hmm. uh, which represent, they say, at only 3% of the total number of tourists that should die when they travel. So if anything, going to the Dominican Republic will extend your life. Uh, <laughs> well, statistically, it's just true. <laughs> Wow, that is really fascinating. And you were right that certainly uh, my impression from just, you know, browsing through the headlines was that this was a much more serious and mysterious crisis. It does not seem to be at all. In fact, uh, an official from the State Department told the New York Times just a couple weeks ago, we have not seen any uptick in the number of U.S. citizens' deaths reported to the department. So there, is this, just, this is just the example of, you know, uh, uh, the re- media just reporting on uh, a, a man, you know, who doesn't look like in, he's in, uh, you know, terrific physical condition, having a heart attack, which is a tragedy. But he could have had that at his home in New Jersey or, or in the Dominican Republic. So, um, you know, the situation seems to be that there's been a handful of, of deaths while people are traveling. And uh, that number seems to be under what we would expect to happen statistically. And the media is just reporting it to get clicks. And I, you know, I just wanted to call that out because the, the, the travel now, uh, the Dominican Republic relies on, they're going to suffer from it. There right. they are. There, there already is a decline in, in of in course, of course. And that, uh, the Dominican Republic relies on this, uh, income for, for, you know, for their country tourism's a massive and in, in important industry. And, um, yeah, I think it would be a shame if folks canceled uh, their trips because there just isn't any evidence, uh, that you are, uh, any more risk to die in the Dominican Republic. I think that is uh, important things to call out. You've called out um, not only that uh, the, they actually have fewer deaths, but that uh, 0.5% of people uh, die when they travel. Is that right? No, 0.015. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> You've also called out that had point. Plus, that would be two. That would be that would be one for every 200 people to travel. That would be a nightmare. You'd be on a flight and people would be dropping dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you you've pointed out that. 0.015% of people who travel die of natural causes. I feel like we could also publicize that better. We should have someone on uh, who has died of natural causes while traveling. Talk to them about the experience. <laughs> All right. We should talk to a Dominican Republic survivor, one of the 2.7 million people who made it back from the Dominican Republic. That's a great speaker. idea. <laughs> anyway, we'll link to this great article from Slate in the, in the show notes. And uh, Kieran, what's your last stop this week? Uh, so my last stop, uh, Ryan, I, I was in uh, New York for, for work this past week and, uh, I didn't see you. I'm sorry. And, uh, it was a, a quick trip and it took me through, uh, what is, uh, if, you know, if you think Times Square is the armpit of the city, uh, I mean, this really must be something in that kind of groin thigh region because it's Herald Square. I, I, is, I mean, is there any place worse than Herald Square? Penn Station. Yeah. Well, Penn Station, that's true, which is the reason I was there, of course. And, uh, but I, at, as I was walking through Herald Square, I, re, I was reminded of a wonderful uh, historic treasure that is right there in the middle of Herald Square. So, you know, you're surrounded by kind of a, a just a soulless nothing area which is with a ton of kind of big brands around you. Do you know about the Herald Square owls? I do not know about the Herald Square owls. So I discovered these uh Years ago, when I lived in New York, and uh, I used to go out on these kind of history hunting missions around New York, 
And uh, it turns out that this monument that you walk by all the time has a special little secret inside of it. So in Herald Square, do you know that monument that's there, the Bennett Monument? Uh, is that the, do you mean the one that's actually in the park, in Herald Square, the park of the man? Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't know anything about it, but yeah, I've seen the monument. Okay, so uh, the monument is there, and it's basically to honor uh, James Gordon Bennett, who was the publisher of the newspaper, the New York Herald, which, of course, sure. the, that's, that's why it's called uh, the Herald New York Square. Herald. But exactly. Yeah. And uh, so when the, when the building was demolished and this park was coming to be, they actually saved a bunch of statuary that had been on the, the, the New York Herald building. And that statuary is what became the monument today and as it happened james gordon bennett loved owls he even had a like like he lo he loved uh owl statues and he, he even had a plan at one time to be buried in an owl casket okay like this guy loved owls he loved them a, a, a casket that it was made for owls because he's <laughs> he'd be a bigger man than that right i mean this is a massive like a no massive no owl. The, no no you've misunderstood <laughs> Oh, the, it's like it's a casket that looks in the like the shape a, of an owl, yes. like a huge owl. That, like it looks like a huge owl that has swallowed you, and you've then it died. Have, in it, it would have to be human sized. That's right. Well, right. O over human sized, in fact, to, to fit the human in it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, it, it didn't come to be, by the way, that he was actually buried in it. Seems but, like a rich guy could make that happen. Pretty low. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, like, get, I don't get know. an I owl, man. You know, I guess he didn't have the plans in place by the uh. time he died. So the, the statue, which you could walk by without really noticing it. I mean, it's got a big bell. It's got these men hitting the bell. Um, but up at the top, there are these two little owls. And what's special about them is that if you look at them, you will see that their eyes glow. They glow and they blink neon green. Wait, wait, the, the owls, the eyes blink? Yeah. The owl I don't, know that I, I don't like, know that I believe and it, you. Ryan, next time you are, for some godforsaken reason, yeah. in Herald Square at, at twilight or, uh, or after, take a look up and you will see on this old looking statue that there are these two owls that look like they have like LED sound system, like plugins into their eyes. Right. Um, and, and, and have like neon Lady Gaga effects. It right. is so weird and freaky, but these are the owls that used to be on the New York Herald building. And in fact, back then their eyes used to light up when clocks in the area told the hour. And now they just blink constantly. It is the weirdest, nuttiest thing, but it's one of these kind of New York treasures that hundreds of thousands of people walk by and, and never think to look up. And now you and our listeners will know to find these owls, giving you a little wink. Well, I am heading to uh, New Jersey very soon. I have to take New Jersey Transit to get there. So I'm going to snap a video of these owls uh, because I need I need to to prove that it exists to the listeners because I they're going to be skeptical. This seems a little, little kind of strange in New York to me. I, I understand, but you can see why this one really uh, is one of these oddities that feeds my wanderlust. And, and it is literally eye-popping. So next week, We'll be talking about the, uh, the, the dangers and uh, pleasures, the ups and downs of staying at B&Bs. All right. Well, until then, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken. Do you have any animals that you're obsessed with, Ryan? I'm obsessed with this little deli cat that, that just moved into my deli next door. Oh, yeah. Is like it a, a deli or bodega? The bodega cat, yeah. Oh, okay. You also oh, call I mean, them I, deli cats. I don't like the idea of a cat near my deli. Mm, it's better than rats, you know, and it's a working cat. It's you know hard, what it is for me is a moose. I'd love to be buried inside a moose. I wouldn't want to be buried inside of a deli cat, but, you know, I, I, you know I'm going to be frozen, so that's different. <laughs> <laughs>